Good morning, everybody. Good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to Wednesday MNR Day. And it gives me great pleasure to, ha to have uh, today's speaker, Siogi Kang, who will talk to us about uh, advanced earth imaging techniques for improved understanding of groundwater systems. And before I introduce uh, Siogi, uh, a quick mention, some of you may be new here looking at the names. It's nice to see some new visitors to our MNR series. If you go on the MTNet website, uh, and here's the link, you'll find um, all previous uh, MNRs. You'll find a video link and the presentation link to them. And so you can view all the past ones, including last year's. And then registration links for uh, upcoming MNRs. And so you can, you can already pre-register for those right up till the end of June. Um, you are on a, uh, a Zoom webinar, so you're, the controls you have, you can set your audio, you can, you can chat if you want to send us a message. Um, a Q&A, so if you want to send a question, um, these will be answered at the end. Please send all your questions in the Q&A, not in the chat. And then if you would like to speak and we encourage your discussion, please uh, raise your hand and uh, I'll authorize you to, to speak. Uh, a quick advertisement for next week's seminar. We have Gary Egbert, who um, all the EM people know, of course, who's going to talk to us on modeling spatial structure of external source fields for induction studies. Uh, but today we have uh, Siogi Kang, as I said. He's, it's wonderful to have Siogi, um, who's going to talk to us about something that's really important to life, and that's uh, groundwater. There's a uh, not, not so much in Canada, because we have a lot, of, <laughs> a lot of water here, but many parts of the world are suffering uh, extreme drought, especially where, um, where Siogi is right now in, in Southern California. So Siogi did his PhD at UBC in 2018 on computational EM, applied to mining problems, and is a postdoc at uh, Stanford. And his research focus is in remote sensing methods for groundwater management and groundwater science. And he continues the development of open source software. Uh, Simpeg, we had a talk from uh, Lindsay uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, and uh, GeoSci and, and others. So I'll now stop sharing, Siogi, and uh, hand over to you. Thank you very much, Alan. Uh, I'll share my screen. And uh, is it showing up, Alan? Yep, perfect. Okay, yeah. Yeah, hello everyone. Uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, advancing earth imaging techniques for improved understanding of groundwater system. And I'm going to use the Central Valley of California as an example. My name is Saki Kang from Stanford University. Although Alan introduced me uh, in, a very, in very details, I kind of want to comment about myself a little bit more. So as Alan said, uh, uh, I did my PhD in UBC and then my expertise in computational electromagnetic geophysics, and especially for inductive source. So today I'm going to focus on airborne electromagnetic uh, method, which use um, uh, this inductive source. And for my PhD, actually, I was interested in uh, the problem called induced polarization, where your electrical resistivity, your property is frequency dependent. And sometimes like a the physical mechanism that kind of manifests is, is the, uh, it's like a, the, the rock can act as like a capacitor. So you can store the energy and release the energy uh, out once the sourcing function is gone. That was basically kind of my PhD understanding how the polarization effect look like in the uh, electromagnetic data and how to ext extract the chargeability information of the surface. And while my PhD, uh, myself and my colleague were interested about developing open source software because we felt that what we were doing, what we were developing in the context of uh, code development was very similar, although our topic was somewhat different. So that was sort of the motivation to develop this open source software package called Simpack. And now it has grown up and actually there are at least like a nine to 10 different institutions who are actively developing Simpack and actively using Simpack uh, package for their research. And uh, well, also for my PhD, I, I, my, my advisor was Doug Oldenburg, uh, who led the UBC GIF group. Uh, and I had a chance to travel with him and uh, for a year uh, to kind of wander around the world and 
basically talking about uh, electromagnetic geophysics and how that can be used. And what I have learned in any places there where I go, they're always problem related to uh, water and the electromagnetic geophysics can play an important role. And that really triggered me to switch my hat from mining problems to water. And that kind of motivated me actually to go to Stanford University working with water problem with uh, Rosemary Knight, uh, who's leading uh, our environmental geophysics group in Stanford. And that's groundwater problem is sort of the major topic that I want to talk about. So let's uh, get into the major topic. So water matters. Uh, there probably no question. And water is important for ourselves uh, as well as for the entire ecosystem. ecosystem. So it's probably like a worthwhile to think about where do we actually get water? Think about that. And one of the major source is the surface water. The surface water means the river or reservoir sort of with the dam that can hold uh, like water from the rains or snows. And this is an image in 2017 at Lake Oroville in uh, Northern California. So there's lots of surface water. So with this surface, this like a, if there's a lots of surface water that can be allocated to like in many different location and they can be used for many different purposes. Like it can be used for domestic drinking water, municipal water for various uh, cities, or it can be used for irrigation in a farming area. Okay, so that's, uh, that's an okay situation. We got enough water. But if we go to a different year, but the same place, the situation can look like this. This was a 2014, which was drought year, meaning there's not much precipitation that can fill in this uh, reservoir. So in this situation, we don't have much surface water, but the demand of water to be used for drinking water, uh, municipals and uh, irrigation for farming, it stays about the same. So, and this is where the problem happens. And in such a case, how do we actually, how do we get the water or where do we get the water? What is the different source of water that can be used? And that is the groundwater, which fills in the pore space of the rocks and sediments like this. And importantly, groundwater occupies 97% of all we could uh, fresh uh, form of fresh water. So like it is a large volume, but the volume is finite. Therefore, uh, like if, with, uh, if, if the water demand is increases with the population growth and climate change, the groundwater sustainability uh, groundwater can be depleted, which threatening the groundwater sustainability, which is a serious problem. And this groundwater sustainability issue, depending upon where you live, as Alan said, in Canada, it may not be a big problem because there are lots of surface water. Or if you go to the Eastern US, it may not be a big problem, but especially in the Western US, it's a serious problem. And especially in the Central Valley of California, where I, where is, which is pretty close to uh, where I located, it's a really, really serious problem. So these are sort of the images that you can see if you drive, uh, like if you cross the Central Valley, which is one of the most productive farmland in the world. And uh, this is not the, the image that I took, but those are sort of like, it, it's not that hard to actually see those images. And what this says, oh, there's no water, meaning, uh, the farmers are losing their jobs. There's no water to irrigate the farms. And the, some of the farms, they are ripping apart their, like their trees, almond trees, like fruit trees, because the, the water is actually so expensive when the demand is very high, but the supply is not enough. So this is really a serious problem. So it is critical to, like, to kind of manage the groundwater, groundwater uh, in, in a sustainable fashion. We need to improve our understanding about the groundwater system. And for this, there are two important things. First, we need to uh, be equipped with an ability to monitor groundwater system like this. And uh, the monitoring groundwater system means like we want, probably want to monitor ground, how the groundwater flow and how the volume of the water changes throughout the time. And given the scale of the problem, it's an extremely challenging task. A typical size of the water basin is about 50 kilometer by 50 kilometer. And uh, you may want to be interested in, in the depth direction, and which is 100 meters of depth. So it's very challenging. And sometimes people forget about the fact that the hydrogeologic structure 
of the subsurface, like where the aquifers are located, which is like a conduit of the flow, where the aquitard, the barrier of the flow, are located. Uh, so this is unknown. So without actually seeing, imaging, hydrogeology of the subsurface under the ground, we cannot really pursue any groundwater science or management. So that's uh, another task. We need to image the hydrogeology of the subsurface. Okay. So there's two important tasks. And the question is like, what is the typical approach or traditional approach that has used to image the subsurface as well as monitoring groundwater system? So it's uh, drilling a well, what I call a well-based approach. As you can imagine, what this well-based approach provides is an accurate point information. And it also provides a direct information about the hydrogeology or orthology and the groundwater head, because we can measure it, the groundwater elevation under the ground. But the downside of this approach, uh, it's actually some, sometimes surprising. The quality of the well data is variable. So if you actually have worked on any types of uh, well data, it's surprising, but the quality is really very. Uh, and uh, sometimes it's, it's pretty hard to assume that your well data has a ground truth. Okay. On top of that, the, the spatial density of the wells are pretty low in lateral dimension. So there's a large gaps in between wells. And in a depth direction, uh, the coverage of the well data is generally like a decreasing with increasing depth because because of increasing drilling costs because it gets more and more important and more and more expensive as you go want to drill deeper. So bottom line is there is a large data gap between wells and at the a portion of the deeper part of the depth. Those are the data gaps. So like a, the question then is how do we really fill in this data gap? And so we need a new methodology. And here today, I'm going to focus on alternate approach, which is earth imaging techniques. And there are many different earth imaging techniques. Today, I'm going to focus on two uh, techniques. Uh, the first one is satellite interferometric synthetic aperture radar called INSAR, which measures the surface deformation uh, from the satellite platform. And the second one is the airborne electromagnetic method, which is an aircraft, and then it measures the resistivity information about the subsurface. So I'm going to start with the first uh, approach, INSAR for monitoring groundwater head. And here's a sort of the simple diagram explaining the INSAR technique. Here's our satellite. And then you can send the electromagnetic pulse, which is relatively high frequency. And then it hits the ground and then come back. So you can actually measure the phase, of, uh, phase difference of this uh, uh, pulse and measures what is the elevation of the ground. And you can actually come back to the same location and send the pulse again measure another phase, and this phase difference gives you information about how much surface deformation is occurred throughout this time period. And that's basically the INSAR data. And the, the, the reason why the INSAR can be a useful data for groundwater, monitoring groundwater head is, is following. Spatial and temporal changes in groundwater head are encoded in the ground deformation. And this results in surface deformation that can be measured by this INSAR technique. And again, INSAR technique has some pros and cons. So start with pros. So INSAR, as you can imagine, it's satellite platform. So it has a great spatial coverage. Basically, you can see the Earth's surface. And the spatial density is about 2,200 meter, which is relatively high. And the temporal sampling rate about six to 12 days. So this is actually not bad. It'll be probably less than uh, the monitoring data uh, that you measure in in situ station. Uh, and Importantly, it is sensitive to the head, changes in head in the deeper aquifers, likely confined or semi-confined. So it has a potential to fill in the data gap in a depth of dimension. But the other, like it is important to understand that what's the limitation of the technique. So first, it what it provides an indirect information about the head, because we are measuring surface deformation, which includes information about the head changes. And there are actually other, many other factors affecting deformation, like hydrologic loading. So when you're interpreting the INSAR data, it is critical to sort of like take into account these limitations. And the second approach is the airborne electromagnetic method called AEM for imaging the subsurface. And here's a, a helicopter. 
and then this a large loop. It's about 10 meter radius, typically. Uh, and then what we do, we inject the current, time varying current, which will generate time varying uh, magnetic field that'll induce the, uh, the eddy currents in the subsurface because the subsurface is a conductor compared to the air. Air is a complete uh, resistor. And this new signal will, like, uh, will depend upon the resistivity structure or values of subsurface that uh, then this uh, currents will give rise to the uh, generate the magnetic field that can be measured at the receiver loop in the form of voltages. Okay, so those are sort of the idea of airborne electromagnetics. And uh, as you can imagine, like uh, it's it's an airborne platform, so you can rapidly uh, it can rapidly map out the large area. And the typical speed is about 100 kilometer per hour. So if you have a 50 kilometer by 50 kilometer water basin, if you use about like five kilometer line spacing, it takes about several days to uh, about a water basin. And importantly, it is sensitive to the large scale structure, like a regional confining unit or uh, top of the basement, which is sort of the first order structure. But it is not necessarily sensitive to very small scale structure, like, I don't know, like, 10 centimeter thick clay uh, with uh, 10 meter uh, uh, lateral scale. And the limitation of this technique is uh, uh, it, what it provides is again, indirect information about electrical resistivity. It does not provide, uh, it's not, does not provide like a direct information hydrogeology. So it is critical to understand the relationship between electrical resistivity and the hydrogeology that you would like to image. And again, uh, the second is like, it, it is limited, it has a limited resolution, which is uh, generally degrading with depth. And it is related to the diffusive nature of uh, electromagnetic geophysics. And kind of, I want to a little bit more elaborate a little bit more about the limitation. So electrical resistivity is, uh, is like this. I'm gonna use the like the consistent color scale. Blue color means the low resistivity. Red color means the high resistivity. If I start from the low resistivity, we have a seawater which have lots of like chlorides and ion that can conduct the current. So it's a very low resistivity. If you go a little bit uh, to the right side and then we have a clays and the clay have a specific structure called electrical double layer that can kind of conduct a large amount of current. It's also a conductor, but the clays in the context of hydrogeology, it's a barrier of the flow. Sand and gravel, it, but the, in the context of hydrogeology, it's a, it's, a, it's a conduit of the flow, but it has a moderate. It has a higher resistivity than clays. And if you go to the right end, we got the bedrock, which is a big resistor. So like a given this kind of uh, close relationship between resistivity and hydrogeologic unit, we have some potential to image the hydrogeology by imaging the resistivity. But importantly, if I draw a line here, for instance, pick a single resistivity value, there's a non-uniqueness because it can be sand and gravel or clays. And these are generally uh, sort of the challenge that we're up against. Uh, so uh, there is uncertainty. And again, uh, the resolution of the AM data is limited. So here's like a simple example. Suppose we have a clay layer embedded in a homogeneous aquifer system. Okay. And uh, so clay is a conductor and the uh, aquifer is a resistor in this case. So if you do an AM experiment and do an imaging process, this red curve is what we can obtain. And this red curve uh, sort of can explain the observed AM data. And what we see is the smooth layer boundaries. And then, uh, and that, that's kind of related to degrading resolution with depth. And also the assumption that we made, uh, like uh, that the resistivity values in vertical direction is smoothly varying. And if I uh, change the depth of the clay, it'll, gets, uh, the resolution gets worse and worse. And that's what I meant, limited resolution of the AF data. And, and again, that's another challenge that we're up against. So, so we have this uh, sort of like a, a kind of high quality remote sensing data in satellite platform or airborne platform, but it has lots of advantages, but it has lots of disadvantages and limitations. So my overarching quite scientific question is, how do we really integrate this modern remote sensing data in a traditional in situ or well data to image the subsurface and monitor groundwater systems? And that's the focus of my talk today. And as I said, today I'm going to focus on the Central Valley of California, and which you, if you haven't been in uh, California or US, this is the West Coast of US, and that's the Pacific Ocean, I think the, the Bay Area where I look at is somewhere here. And this is the Sierra 
Nevada mountains, and those are the coastal ranges, and LA is somewhere here. And Central Valley is uh, one of the most uh, productive farmland in the world. And to maintain that agricultural productivity, it uses significant amount of surface water as well as groundwater. And between 2012 and 17, California really suffered from severe drought, which has drastically increased about groundwater, amount of groundwater pumping. Because as you can imagine, the, the, the image that I have shown when we don't have surface water, you just need to use the groundwater, so you pump a lot. And that really threatened the groundwater sustainability in the region. And that kind of, ref by reflecting that fact, Californian governments legislated uh, what's called Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, called SIGMA, in 2014, which actually put some sort of regulation about using groundwater. And that with that uh, act, each water community need to come up with their own groundwater sustainability water sustainability plan. And that kind of shows the amount of like a stress, water stress in the region and the importance of understanding the groundwater system in this location. And California can be, at the Central Valley of California can be divided up to a Northern Sacramento Valley here, in the Southern San Joaquin Valley. And the Southern San Joaquin Valley generally have a very, the, the warmer and drier, and also like a, which really result in uh, like a, more pumping of groundwater and then more pumping of groundwater also generates the ground subsidence. And this is the image uh, from the INSAR data between 2015 and 19 for the five years. And this red color means a large subsidence is about 1.3 meter. So for five years, every year is about 25 centimeter per year. So this kind of substance can actually generate a huge problem for a groundwater system because it, it actually, we're losing the, the groundwater storage capacity permanently. And also that can uh, cause a damage for infrastructure like canals or highways or road, which could make a, a kind of catastrophic uh, sort of uh, uh, economic uh, disadvantage. So let's actually think about why we're getting subsidence a little bit more. So to understand that, we need to know what is the aquifer system of the Central Valley. So aquifer system of the Central Valley mostly composed of the sediments like sand and gravel or clays. And this is sort of like typical conceptual diagram. And there are numerous intervatic clays, this like brownish colors. There are lots of clay patches, which we call intervatic clays. And it, has, it also includes a regional confining unit called Colcron Clay, which divides the uh, aquifer system into shallow and confined aquifer and the deep confined aquifer. And then base of the deep confined aquifer, there's an impermeable base. And uh, that's sort of the aquifer system of the Central Valley. And when you are pumping from this deep confined aquifer, it reduces, what's happening, it reduces the head. And that generates a gradient head gradient between this clays and the coarse grained materials. And, and that gradient actually drives a drain of the water from clays to coarse. And it, it is a diffusive process, it takes a time. And this is because of the very low heavily conductivity of the clays. And this draining process due to the heavily gradient compacts the inurbated clays. So it actually, uh, uh, and then the reason why it, it kind of like a major compaction is happening in this intermediate clays is the clay, compress clay compressibility is much larger than the coarse grained materials. Okay. So, so the, in summary, the driving force of, uh, of like a why we're having the subsidence is the head change in the deep confined aquifer, but it is modulated by intermediate clays. So resulting subsidence and surface affirmation that we can be measured in the INSAR data is modulated by uh, intermediate clays. So understanding both is important. But, but like a, <laughs> when you're knowing what is the subsurface look like, you can actually kind of think about this process and understand it. But if you actually don't know the subsurface, uh, it actually generates lots of challenges. And that another challenge is measurement of head data are very sparse in space and time, which kind of provides a motivation to develop a new uh, technique by using the insert data. So today I'm going to show, uh, there was sort of the background. Today I'm going to show the two sort of examples. Uh, first one will be airborne, using airborne EM for imaging the large scale structure. And the second one is the INSAR for monitoring groundwater head. Okay. And I'm going to focus on location called the Cuellasa Basin located here. And this is the location where we see the large subsidence 
and the groundwater issues in this location is pretty uh, serious. So I'm okay, going to start with the uh, case study in Cuyasa Basin in California, and the title is The Improved Imaging of the Large-Scale Structure of a Groundwater System with uh, Data. And when thinking about like a, managing the groundwater system in a sustainable fashion, the groundwater model is a foundation for that, like a foundation well, tool to do so. Okay. And to generate the groundwater model, the input is the, the large scale structure of the groundwater system, like a regional confining layer that I have shown program clay, or the base uh, of the groundwater system, which could be the top of the basement in, in, in the Central Valley. So like a kind of, the first order of interest when we're imaging the subsurface from airborne data is this large scale structure, and that's the focus of this uh, example. So what we have developed is a, a new approach to map out the large scale structure, and the source of the data source are airborne data and a few high quality wells that we can kind of consider that as a ground proof. And the key improvement that we made was incorporating prior knowledge into the inversion step to overcome the non-uniqueness in the resistivity values as well as the limited resolution of the airborne data. And the motivation that we had for this study was the large scale airborne EM project led by California Department of Water Resources. And this is sort of this like a gray area and uh, like a, this region shows where this California, uh, California DWR are planning to do an airborne EM survey with their uh, large scale AM project. And with this project, they're basically covering the entire Central Valley and some of the regions in, in California. And bottom line is like there will be lots of airborne data in, in California. That means if we develop a technology that can generate the large scale structure to generate that can generate the high quality groundwater model, this is a great opportunity to transfer the developed technology into other regions. So that was our motivation for this study. And the study area is the Cuellar Subbasin, and this is the Cuellar Subbasin, that's the Central Valley. And again, there is a serious groundwater issue in this location. And this is like an, an existing groundwater model. Uh, and uh, you can actually think that as a large scale structure or a hydrogeologic model. And here's the Corcoran clay, which is low resistivity, lower resistivity than the background aquifer, which divides the upper and lower aquifers. And below the Corcoran clay, there's a low permeability sediment, which is likely uh, clay rich, so it has a low resistivity. And uh, if you go towards the east, there's a bedrock, and that's close to the Sierra Nevada mountains. And the bedrock has high resistivity. Now, the scale is about 60 kilometer, and the depth scale is about 500 meters. So this is sort of the typical conceptual model of subsurface. And the targets that we aim to resolve and, and, and the prior knowledge that the targets are following. So actual study was focused on two targets, top of the bedrock and the confining layer. Today, given the limited time, I'm going to focus on the confining layer, the Corcoran clay. And what we're expecting uh, for the Corcoran clay is a large resistivity contrast between the clay and the surrounding aquifers. And so we're expecting a sharp resistivity uh, change. And the thickness of the clay uh, is much smaller than thickness of the aquifers. Okay? So those are two prior knowledge that we're going to incorporate in the inversion process or imaging process to uh, improve the accuracy uh, of the imaging. And available data, we got airborne EM data acquired in 2018 using the SkyTem system. And that black dots shows where the AM data are acquired and you see lots of empty spots. That's, uh, that's, exa that's exactly where the cities or some sort of infrastructure are located. And by law in the US, you cannot really fly over uh, the domestic area. So we have some sort of data gap in the AM data as well. And uh, this well A and B and C shows the high quality well data sort of penetrating that core crunch clay. And we will use that as uh, ground truth data later in the process. And I haven't sort of showed sort of like showed how the inversion can like be used, but uh, here's sort of like an explicit explanation about the AM inversion methodology. From the AM experiments, we measure the data, and then you can think that as we're having multiple maps because uh, uh, we have multiple time channels uh, of the data, like which is the voltages, 
And usually for that SkyTime system, we got about 40 to 50 time channels. So you can think about, we got 50 maps of the data covering a water basin scale. And uh, so you got lots of points of the data, but like the data, by looking at it, you can have some idea how the subsurface looks like, but it is not that kind of intuitive to understand the subsurface. So what we do is, we, what we want to do is what we want, like a, we want to obtain a resistivity model of subsurface that can fit the observed airborne EM data, and that's called inversion process. Okay. And the tool that I uh, have developed to do this inversion process is available through the Simpex software that I had mentioned in the beginning. So I'm going to start with the uh, conventional inversion approach, which assumes a smooth transition of resistivity in vertical and lateral dimension as a, as a prior information. But we also try to fit the airborne EM data. And this is sort of a little bit of like a mathematical form of inversion methodology. What we're doing, we're minimizing this objective function. So sum of data misfit plus uh, uh, regularization function multiplied by trade of parameter beta. So, like uh, there's uh, two sort of terms that we're playing with. Uh, there's a data misfit and the uh, prior information that we're injecting through this regularization. And the regularization is uh, composed of uh, three terms, like two terms of a smallness. Uh, and the smallness term means uh, we want a model that are close to a reference model. The smoothness means that we're assuming the, the resistivity value in space, like horizontal direction and vertical direction, changing smoothly. Okay. And there are a few flexible parameters. By adjusting these parameters for each regularization term, the, the resulting image of the subsurface can be different. Okay. That's the inversion methodology. And for the conventional approach, we're just going to use the smoothness. So we're just assuming a smooth transition of resistivity in lateral and vertical direction. And by applying this conventional inversion, that's the 3D resistivity model that we can obtain. So we're moving from west to east. So this is the Sierra Nevada, and that's the, the valley. And we're seeing the scale depth scale of 300 meter. Blue color means the low resistivity, and high color means the uh, red color means the high resistivity. So, and then bottom plot, we show the existing groundwater model. And just by comparing these two images, you can see relatively good kind of uh, close relationship between these two. So what we're seeing is the Corkman clay here which divides the upper and the lower aquifer. As you go towards the east, you see this low permeability or low clay rich sediments, low resistivity sediments, which correspond to low permeability sediments. And then as you go towards the foothill, we see the top of the bedrock, okay? So like a given this groundwater model was generated with lots of well data, the, what, what the airborne EM technique can do is actually, it's not bad, it's actually pretty good. But let's actually kind of go look at a little bit detail about how well the airborne EM did to image the subsurface. So what I'm showing is the vertical section of the resistivity uh, uh, from the south to north. And uh, this is the Corcoran clay. And I sort of subjectively draw a line top of the Corcoran clay and base of the Corcoran clay like this. And if you roughly estimate the thickness, it's about 100 meter thick. And what we also see is a smooth transition of the resistivity in vertical direction due to our assumption as well as the resolution, limited resolution. And this, like if you just provide that to 100 meter thick coconut clay to a hydro hydro hydrologist or hydrogeologist in the region, they may not like uh, agree with that because uh, they have known from some of the drilling result, the thickness of the coconut clay is supposed to be 10 to 20 meter. So we're way overestimating. Uh, the thickness of the Corcoran clay in this case. So what do we do uh, to improve the, like overcome this challenge? And that's what uh, we developed, uh, what we call used uh, like a targeted inversion approach. And then what we're doing, we're utilizing the prime knowledge of the targets, especially for the Corcoran clay. And the mathematically, what we're doing is uh, to incorporate that sort of prime knowledge of the target, we're modifying the norm of the regularization term for smallness and smoothness in horizontal direction and vertical direction. So we're gonna expand that test two norm into a P norm. And what P norm does uh, is kind of following. Suppose like, a, like the recalling the target, the confining layer has a, a 
large resistivity contrast between the coconut clay and the surrounding aquifer. What we're expecting is the sharp resistivity contrast in between two units. So if you actually change the p-value for the smoothness term in vertical direction, that's what's happening. So in two, it kind of very smooth. One, it gets a little bit sharper, but by setting p0, you can get really sharp resistivity contrast. Okay, so p0 might be better. And the, for the second one, the thickness of the clay is being much smaller than thickness of the aquifer. We can actually impose the p-value for the smallness term. And by decreasing p-value from two, one, zero, you can get much spiky uh, result. So again, p0, we can actually impose that to have uh, much thinner clay uh, to be imaged. So that's sort of the core idea uh, used for the targeted inversion approach. And uh, there, are actually, there were actually many other steps that we have in post, but so if you're interested, I can talk a little bit more uh, later in the Q&A session, but that was the core idea. And this is the image that we can obtain from the targeted inversion approach. So this is the coconut clay layer. As expected, we see the large resistivity contrast between the coconut clay and the surrounding aquifers. And uh, we also see <clears throat> much thinner coconut clay images compared to the conventional approach. Okay, and if that prior one information was correct, I think that you may prefer this one much better. But sometimes actually, it, it's hard to it's hard to know whether this one is better and that one is better because two resistivity models are equally fitting the Erbonium data. So that was the reason why we need the high quality well data, but at few locations. So this is a comparison of uh, the the inversion result with the well data. And uh, at well A, and we're showing the result at well A and well B, the black curve is the resistivity log. And the blue region is the, the interval of the coconut clay that we were able to uh, observe from the driller's log. So it's pretty obvious that target inversion approach did a much better job to image the coconut clay compared to the conventional approach. And like uh, this well data actually was used in, 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 in the target inversion approach to pick uh, a right like uh, parameters. And, uh, and at the end, like uh, we can have a three-dimensional view of the final resistivity model, which looks like this. You can see the coconut clay, which divides the upper and lower aquifer and the top of the bedrock image it here. And we actually, at the end, we compared this, uh, the estimated uh, geometry of the coconut clay with the existing groundwater model. And they were, uh, were quite compatible. Yeah, I could, uh, if you're interested, I could show after the session, but uh, I'm not gonna go there. So to summarize, like a study we developed an approach and this developed approach is transferable to other regions and can be used to develop a high quality groundwater model from AEM data. And this was quite exciting because there are lots of like airborne data available in the Central Valley. And there will be lots of need to develop high quality groundwater model in many regions in the Central Valley to generate their sustainable groundwater plan. The second study is this, uh, is the recovering groundwater head from INSAR surface deformation data. This. And uh, I want to revisit like this uh, conceptual model of surface deformation. So again, when pumping the groundwater, it reduces the head and that drains the water from the clays to coarse grained materials. And the diffusive process takes time. And that's the mechanism which compacts the innervated clays. And again, the driving force of the head change in the deep confined aquifer. And the reason why it happening, it's mostly happening in the deep confined aquifer is it's a pressurized system, which generates much greater head change compared to this unconfined system. But this, uh, the measures like uh, this resulting deformation uh, that can be measured by insert data is modulated by properties of, of the interpreted clays, like uh, the conductivity of the clays or thickness of the clay or a fraction of the clay. And that's sort of where like uh, airborne EM that I have shown can actually provide some information about the subsurface. And I'm gonna talk about at the end about that. And, but the goal of this study was uh, recovering groundwater head from this INSAR data, okay? And okay, if this uh, was actually possible, what's actually really cool, that you got many INSAR time series throughout the Central Valley it means if you can recover the head, uh, groundwater head of the deep confined aquifer at each point, you can actually have like a recovered head value uh, for the entire central valley. So this, this was like a 
this could be, this could actually make a pretty big impact, but you actually need to start with a single point. And that's actually the focus of this talk. So and then this is an example, co-located INSAR and head data are located here at, at a Quaya subbasin. And the uh, X axis time and the left hand axis shows the head, measured head from the confined aquifer. And right hand axis shows the defor surface deformation measured by INSAR. Okay, so I'm gonna start, oh, the blue color means the wet season and the white color means dry season. Wet color means they're more, uh, precipitation and white color means that there was no uh, precipitation. And this period between 2012 and 15 was a drug period. Okay, so I'm gonna start with the head data. So head data is generally decreasing with the drug period and sort of oscillating with the seasons. And after the drug period, head recovers. So in the context of water management, it's actually good. So we're recovering the head after the droughts. And then was recovering sort of about like a similar position where before the drought. So that's not bad. But if you actually look at this, the surface deformation measured by INSAR, and it actually decreasing in the drop period, which makes sense because there's a big head drops. And I just keep decreasing and decreasing, although the head was stabilized after the drought. And that's actually due to that diffusive process, which takes time. So head drop happened in the past, actually making an impact in the current time. Okay. And then even with the increase in head, it's actually not that the surface deformation is not uplifting. It's just like sort of plateauing. And with the decreasing head, it goes down. And with the increase in head, it just all again uh, plateauing. So there was a kind of interesting fact that increasing head, even increasing head, you cannot really stop uh, stopping the subsidence, which is a challenge. So it, this is a pretty challenging problem to actually stop the subsidence. Anyway, so our interest is like starting from the insert data, going backward and recovering the head data like this. And for the recovery of the head data, so for a problem that we're solving for a give, like if we, we can, for uh, first, like from the given head data and the like, property of the clays, we can generate the insert data. So that's the four problem. But what we really want to do is going backward, okay? So we want to uh, start from the insert data, going backward and recover the head data uh, measured from these coarse grained materials in the confined aquifer. And you can actually use the same form of inversion, uh, sort of similar inverse framework that I have used in Erwin-Yam, but it requires the force simulation and sensitivity calculation, which I used to do uh, for developing EM inversion code. So I did it. Uh, and it's important, like today I'm going to focus on that I know this uh, properties of the clays, but in practice, uh, you need to actually estimate property of the clays as well, like hydraulic conductivity, thickness, and volume. And the reason why that I could assume that I know those property, there are, were other people who estimated this property for a given head data, as well as the surface deformation data. So I used that property. And so this, an example that I am showing is just a proof of concept. So I picked a location here in Quaya Basin, close to the location that I have shown. And uh, I, like, I picked the uh, many INSAR time series within the three kilometer radius. And like I'm showing that data and I took the mean, I used that as an observed data. And this is the INSAR data, which I set that as an observed data. And this dashed line is the initial hat that I have set. Actually, like a setting this decreasing initial hat was important because the head drop in the past actually making an impact in the current INSAR data. So that was actually an important point. And by uh, proceeding the inversion process, these were uh, the head data that I was able to recover and I, fit, I fitted the observed INSAR data for a given uh, level of uncertainty. And by looking at it, like, okay, <laughs> it looks okay, but what does that mean? Is that really like meaningful? So that is the reason why we needed a co-located data that I have shown. So this co-located data is within that radius that I have set. And that was the insert data. So if I compare the, the recovered head data and the observed head data, it actually shows uh, quite a bit of similarities. I'm starting from, in, from here, the time span where we did not have the insert data. 
And it's not that good, but what we're capturing is sort of the kind of very large scale decaying feature. But within the time span where we got the in-store data, we're doing a pretty good job. So it goes down, down, goes up, up, down, down, and up. And this feature, we, the measurements only have two sampling in between these two times, but the recovered has this kind of feature, which we discovered. And then again, going down and going up. And we didn't have head data here, but uh, the time sampling, temporal sampling of the insert data was much better. So we can actually recover head data with much better time sampling. Okay, So that was actually quite promising. And uh, that was sort of it to, as, a, as a proof of concept. But kind of by extending this to an entire Central Valley, we can actually have a tool to monitor groundwater head, changes in groundwater head in the deep confined aquifer, and we can actually fill in the data gap. So what we have shown is the potential to utilize the insert data as a tool to monitor head changes in semi-confined or confined aquifers in the Central Valley of California. And like a, for that extension, let's think about what is the data gap to to this idea to a water basin scale or Central Valley scale. And first we need to know the core quantum clay and depth and thickness and location or absence or presence. And I have shown airborne yam can play an important role to image this confining layer, which actually provides this uh, very pressurized system of the confined aquifer. But you also need to know the thickness of the confined aquifer and the clay fraction within the aquifer or thickness distribution of the clay thickness. And AM cannot provide all of this information, but can provide some information. And by, by integrating AM data as well as well data, we can obtain some information about this. And, and when we're setting up the inverse problem, we can actually use that as data or some sort of prior information. And that's where I am going to monitor groundwater head throughout uh, at, the, at the Central Valley of California. So we have a remote sensing data, which was insert data, provide head information modulated by clays. AM data provides information about clays, which is the cloak, like a, which is a link between these two. And the well data provides sparse sampling of the head data. So we have some sort of ground truth measurement in a sparse location, as well as have the lithology data provide some sort of information about the clay fraction and the thickness distribution. So by combining all of this data, we can potentially actually achieve monitoring the groundwater head in the Central Valley of California. That's where I'm going. And uh, <clears throat> well, how I'm sort of viewing this problem, there could be many different ways to accomplish this data integration problem. But uh, like given my expertise in inverse problem, this is sort of the view that I am asking. So I want to stick for a head like head H, which is a distribution in X and Y and time. And uh, N parameters related to the clays P that can fit the INSAR AM and well data and favoring available prior information. So I can put it into sort of the same inverse framework that I have used a one yam and the insert data inversion. Uh, my model parameter is the head like head and the distribution of the clays. And my data misfit is expanded to a three different data, INSAR data, Carbonium data and well data. Prior information, it's an open question what we can use. But for instance, we can use the existing groundwater model as a prior information. And or we can actually couple this with the hydrologic process uh, and, and then remote sensing data. So how do we do that is again, uh, how do we solve this inverse problem is again open question, but the, this is sort of the, the kind of holistic view that I am seeing the problem. And how I want to realize this idea is, uh, is like using open source toolbox and framework Simpack, which actually provides this uh, modular toolbox that can build up this inverse framework. And uh, currently, uh, Simpack can provide uh, this multiple physics like gravity, magnetics, and DC versus TV electromagnetics. But uh, this really provides a kind of a framework and toolbox that can actually thinking about solving this uh, large and challenging problem. And uh, most of the research code that developed for my research are publicly available through the Simpack software. And I was actually a co-creator of this uh, software package with uh, Lindsay, Rowan, and Doug. And Lindsay actually and Rowan and Doug I gave that MNR talk previously. And what's really exciting, there is a larger volume of high quality remote data coming 
in, in the Central Valley. So today, I'm, I'm, I'm just showing that in the Central Valley case, but in the world, there are actually lots of Erwinian data emerging in these data, as well as remote sensing data. In the Central Valley or California, there's this large scale AM project basically covering the entire Central Valley. It's really exciting. So we're gonna get lots of Erwinian data in California. And the, the same, uh, the California Department of Water Resources are also paying a company to process the insert data every six months. So we're gonna get the process insert data for every six months covering the entire Central Valley. So we we're getting lots of data and that, that idea that I have proposed, if you can actually do that, they could actually generate really a useful monitoring system that can be really useful to uh, kind of make a sustainable plan for a groundwater system in the Central Valley. And here's my conclusion, like uh, there are like a lots of like a remote sensing data and uh, which I have shown today was airborne and, and insert, but there are other remote sensing data, for instance, GRACE, uh, which can be used to uh, monitor the groundwater volume. For instance, but the, 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 the bottleneck of the, the GRACE is the resolution is so low. One pixel is about 200 kilometer or 100 kilometer. So the, like, the, the question is how to really downscale like uh, this, uh, uh, like a low resolution measurement and recover uh, high resolution water volume change. And, and sort of the obvious answer is like integrating this GRACE data with other types of data that I have shown, like insert data, Erwinium data, and well data, such that uh, we can monitor the spatial and temporal changes in groundwater head, as well as the groundwater volume or some other property that could be useful for groundwater management. And, and that's sort of like a sort of the big picture idea. And my goal is to maximize the value of earth imaging techniques and especially electromagnetic, electromagnetic geophysics for improved understanding of the groundwater system. And sometimes this is obviously beyond my scope uh, and, and like a, that I can solve. So I absolutely need to collaborate with uh, people from multiple disciplines and multiple sectors uh, in academia or commercial sectors or uh, like institutional, but uh, it's it kind of provides me like really really inspiring me and excited is the fact that the geophysical data can actually play an important role to fill in the data gap and actually improve understanding about the groundwater system and that could make a high impact to the public living there. So yeah, so that's that was it and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sogi. That was absolutely brilliant, you know, and I think if. Uh... It offers hope to the world, places like Africa, where water is a very, very scarce resource, if we can map it quickly and efficiently. Um, so everyone, please uh, throw your questions into the Q&A, and I'm, I'll read out the question so it gets in the recording. Uh, but before we jump to the questions, I'm going to take advantage of being the host and ask the first one, and that's to do with the inversion itself. You set the inversion up with a continuous resistivity distribution. Could you not set it up with uh, PDFs to describe each of the units based on well log information? Uh, yes, yes, we, we could we could do that uh, as well. So let's say if you have like a two major jaws a unit and uh, we can actually kind of put that as a prior information as well. Uh, but the yeah, like uh, the reason why we used the P norms because it, that that spatial feature was quite obvious, and that was sort of kind of very intuitive form that we could we could use. So that was the reason why. But there is a potential by imposing kind of that geological information, and then that and then like, the resistivity is attached to that geological information, so we can actually further use that information. Well, one other quick uh, inversion question towards the end: you you've got uh, three terms in your misfit function. <laughs> one for each of three data types. Right. Uh, a, a huge issue when you're doing joint inversion is, is how to balance those terms. Right. How right. do you do that? Right. <laughs> That's an open question, I, I'm, which I'm not 100% sure. So, like, a, so this is kind of the problem where if you think about really using geophysics to constrain hydrologic process, now you have a multiple misfit terms and then like, as you said, does putting everything into a single inverse framework is really a good way to go? Or like a, doing a, some sort of subsequent process and then iterate? I think, uh, 
I'm not sure what's the best way. I actually probably don't have a good answer. So you actually just need to explore it and then try it, which part could be the best, I, I guess. Uh, so yeah, I probably have a, I don't have a good answer about that, I guess. <laughs> okay, so we'll, we'll move on to questions. We have a, a couple in already. If anyone wants to discuss, please uh, raise your hand and uh, I'll make you uh, speakable. <laughs> So the first one's from uh, Elizabeth Barani. Thank you, Elizabeth, for the question. Is there seawater contamination as a result of the reduction of the aquifer? Uh, and the second question, what is geologically happening to the east end of the confining layer of clay? You know, it, it sort of disappeared. Uh, yeah, so the first question, yes, if you go, like not in the Central Valley, but if you go to the coastal area, like Monterey Coast in California, there's a huge amount of seawater intrusion. Actually, we did the time-lapse airborne EM survey to image where the seawater uh, intrusion surface uh, interface between seawater and salt, uh, salt water and freshwater uh, is. Um, so that's probably answered the first one. And yeah, so that like that reduced the, uh, the amount of freshwater volume that can be used. Uh, so it's a serious problem. And second question is uh, what's happening? Like uh, there's, there was a deposition of the sediment so that the Corcoran clay was uh, deposited with, I think it's related to the marine deposit, like a marine set types of uh, setup, but there was like a sediment deposit part is through these mountain ranges. So I think that kind of severed that, uh, that and break apart those, uh, the Corcoran clay. So actually, <laughs> if you go toward the east, there's a patches of the Corcoran clay. But the, 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 the idea that we had, we want to image the continuous portion of the Corcoran clay rather than the breaked part, because uh, if that clays are breaked apart, it actually gives a pretty good connection between the upper and the lower aquifer. So the next one is uh, Jiban Panthi. Um, great talk, Yogi. A question, can we estimate hydrogeological parameters, porosity, hydraulic conductivity using AEM imaging? which we can use for groundwater modeling? If yes, how reliable are the estimation? Yeah, if that's possible, I'm like a company and sell it. <laughs> uh, it's pretty hard because the there it's electrical resistivity is connected, I guess, right. with the hydraulic uh, parameters, but there's no direct relationship. And actually in the field scale, it's actually hard to know. So I think the best way, if you got the ground truth measurements, and then building up the relationship and with, with, with the resistive information that you recover from your body, and then the information from the in-situ data, and then considering the scaling issues, I think that's probably the way to go. And then I think you can backpropagate the relationship into the entire resistivity of uh, information from the body data, which has much better uh, data coverage and uh, so that's probably way to go, I guess. Uh, yeah, I mean, conductivity really is a function of permeability, right? It's, it's how permeable the, the rock matrix is. Right, right. Uh, Vikas Baranwal uh, asks, a very impressive talk. Does SIMPEG perform full 3D inversion for frequency domain airborne EM as, as well? And how large a data set, can it handle? <laughs> uh, great question. Uh, so I did not mention what I have done was not necessarily the full 3D inversion. So the typical traditional tool used in Airborne YAM is the what's called stitched inversion, or sometimes it's called spatially constrained inversion. So you, what you do, you invert each of the sounding with 1D, but regularize in, in lateral and vertical direction. So that's what we developed through the SIMPAC. But the SIMPAC actually performs full 3D inversion, but we're not necessarily ready to handle the size of the data that I have shown. It'll take... Uh, really, really long time to do that uh, using the current SIMPEC, but we're getting there. And then with the increasing computation power and then available computation resources, we can absolutely parallelize the process and obtain an ability that can kind of use the 3D inversion as a sort of the standard tool. Uh, that's my personal goal, but uh, we haven't got that yet. Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. Back, to, back to the 1D inversion, would it not make more sense to use a layered earth rather than a continuous? Uh, can you elaborate a little bit more, uh, Alan? What does you, what what do you mean the continuous earth and the layered earth? Well, continue, continuous resistivity variation. Oh, oh, I see, I see, I see, I see, I see, I see. Gotcha. Uh, I think uh, it, it, there are 
pros and cons, I guess. But sometimes, uh, if you actually, like uh, when that layered earth is relevant, let's say you have a groundwater model. And a groundwater model is basically a layered sort of model. And then if you actually, if your goal is updating your groundwater model and updating how like parameters of the groundwater model, I think actually setting up that exact same layering of the groundwater model can be actually useful, I guess, because you you have a focused question. We, what we want to do is basically updating how to like parameters of the each layer. So that's sort of like a, there are different ways that you can use rather than using continuous multiple layer inversion or you can use the few layer inversion as well. So we've got three more questions rolled in. Well, another one from Elizabeth. Uh, isn't collaborative inversion of different geophysical data converge better than simultaneous inversion? Could you elaborate? <laughs> I think in my experience, that really depends upon the noise structure of, uh, of the data. So if the data is pretty clean, and then let's like uh, limit the scope into two different AM data sets. And if the noise structure is pretty clean, I think the actually simultaneous inversion helps. And, and an example is that SkyTIM system has a dual moment. So it's kind of like a two types of measurement, although it's the same kind of the system. So you have a different waveform of the data, but you're inverting those two time curve together. And what I have found is actually converts better just using the single moment. So in such a case, I think it is, but in practice, I think noise structure general in EM data, different EM, EM data is quite different. So it's more challenging in practice. Right, and uh, Lingaru Nibera, and I'm sorry for mangled your name, Lingaru. Thank you, Dr. Siogi. Are the two pieces of information interpreted individually or any means to do the joint inversion, any numerical relation? Can we apply the inside technology in hard rock formation for groundwater application? Ah, uh, um, that are the pieces of important. Can you elaborate? Like, what I'm not sure is that the referring INSAR and AEM inversion, yeah. two pieces of information. Yeah. Uh, yes, yes. I think that's probably the first approach that I would do. So let's say what you can do from the AEM, you can obtain, let's say, clay fraction information or the thickness of the aquifer. And then you can basically use that as a prior to invert the insert data. That's probably what I would do as a first shot. Uh, for the second one, yeah, so those are like the clay is the numerical, like it's, it's the physical linkage. And uh, yes, I guess, but I'm not sure hard rock formation, you wouldn't see that much uh, that formation that we have shown. I guess, because uh, the reason why it's compacting so much, it's because of clay. It's a special property of the clay. So I'm not sure how much uh, information you would get from the hard rock formation, but absolutely it'll deform, but I'm not sure the the, the level of deformation, because instar data has some noise level. It's about nine millimeter, for instance. So um, not sure that level is higher than the noise level. Yeah, another problem, I guess, in the hard rock, like in Canada, the uh, the groundwater can be quite saline, and the Archean yeah. brines can be very saline, 100 yeah. Siemens per meter or higher. So that kind of throws off, you know, you're looking for pure water, right, which is resistive. Right, right, right. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that kind of gives you an absolutely narrow down. Oh, this is not the location if you want to find fresh water sources. <laughs> <laughs> Um, a question from Didas Makoye. Good talk about the targeted inversion. How does it affect the thickness of the aquifers above and below the conductive clay? Uh, so, yeah, but uh, how does it affect? Uh, actually, uh, it, so <laughs> the, the actual form that we've done, so we first did the LP norm inversion and then map out the top and base of the Corcoran clay first. And then that actually generated the continuous surface of the model. And that could be used for the groundwater model. And after that, what we've done, so now you got the, you actually know the geometry of the large scale structure. So you know the, where the boundary of the Corcoran clay and the bedrock. So we had actually did the subsequent inversion with the with using that as a constraint, so we allow the like a sharp interface between this, and then reinverted that data, and then what we found, we were able to have a greater resistivity in the upper uh, upper aquifer 
and that was actually expected. So upper aquifer from the well data, it has more coarse grained material compared to the lower aquifer. So by doing so, we were able to get sort of the smaller scale information within, within the large scale units. I guess that's probably answering the question. Okay, um, Mike McMillan. Um, hey, Selgi, excellent talk as always. For the Sky 10 data, did you invert the high moment and low moment together jointly or sequentially? Uh, we invert it jointly. Ah. Okay. That's not quite sure I know what that means. <laughs> uh, so I think uh, the, what that means, uh, it, it's uh, sometimes you can actually, let's say, invert the high moment data first, and then you got the resistivity, and then you can reinvert that low moment with that resistivity. So that's what he asked. Yeah. Okay, I think that's all the uh, questions we have. There's just a few comments in the chat. Oh, oh thank you very much. Um, comment from Jerry Ross, Roth. Hi, Jerry. Uh, referring to yesterday's uh, University of Toronto presentation by Zhong Yu Yu of PGC on determining hydrogeological parameters from DC resistivity. I guess that's something else, but the problem with ground-based techniques is you slow coverage, right? That's the advantage of airborne. Okay, everyone, thanks again very much, Sylvie, for giving us the time, and thanks everyone in the audience for your participation, and we'll see everyone uh, next week um, for uh, Gary Egbert's uh, presentation. Bye, everybody. Thank you very much. Bye.